home. <laughs> Just like in performance sometimes. Mm -hmm. I had a videographer one time totally forget to film like half of the beginning of the entire show or something like this. And it was the last show that we did. So we weren't going to do it again. Do it again. Um, or he totally forgot. Yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> But welcome everybody and Tanya Burka for joining us for another artist interview today. Um, love having you here. And just to kick it off, I'm gonna let you give us a little background history of how you got doing what you're doing from as far back in your childhood as you want to go um, to present day and your projects. Cool, all right, I'm gonna give the super condensed version because this, this is a weird one. Um, I grew up doing artistic gymnastics um, and was not particularly good at it. You can't see here when I give this talk in person, it works much better. I'm, I'm about five foot ten. Um, and that is not the size that gymnasts are. So I just did it because I, I loved it and I loved being upside down and flipping and going up high. And that was what was that was what was available when I was growing up. Um, and my high school did a very unusual program uh, where at the last month of senior year, they would kick out all of the senior students, go somewhere, do something, be nominally supervised, and uh, come back at the end of the month and do a presentation on it, and then you graduate uh, because you don't want to be here and we don't want to put up with you. Uh, it was called Senior Project. Uh, and at the time, I um, was applying to engineering schools and thought I was going to go off and work for NASA or something. And I thought, okay, this is like the last time in my life that I genuinely get to have a little fun. Um, and in those slow and grinding days of early internet, I tried to find a circus school that I might be able to go and learn at. So I wound up moving to San Francisco for that month. Uh, their student exchange slave, who they normally had, actually had scarlet fever, so it was perfect timing. Um, uh, I went out and took a few classes in exchange for, you know, fixing the copy machine and organizing their filing system and handing out flyers and fixing the copy machine and just, you know, sweeping the floors, all kinds of, you know, whatever. Um, and that was my first exposure to circus was that one month. So at the end of the month, I, you know, packed up to, to go back to where I grew up and graduate from high school. And a few of the teachers grabbed me and said, Hey, by the way, because we don't know if you've ever considered this, but there are places where you can train to do this professionally. <laughs> like, and you could probably get into one of those schools. I mean, if not have fun being a rocket scientist, but like, <laughs> bye. Um, and and this like literally was the the first time that I I realized that you could become a circus performer short of having been born into one. Um, and then I thought about what my parents would say if I went home and said, "By the way, I'm not going to go off and become an engineer. I'm going to join the circus." And their response at that point probably would have been to bury the body where no one could find it. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, and I'd done it for a month. So I said, okay, you know what, this is really cool. This is a really amazing idea. And it's really powerful right now. But let's, let's do what I set out to do and start getting my degree. And you know what, if it's really important, I'll know. Um, and it just the idea kept sticking with me and sticking with me and sticking with me. And so, you know, finally, towards the end of getting my undergraduate degree, I, I told my parents, you know, don't panic now. But this is something I've been thinking about doing. I'm going to go and audition for some schools. And if none of them take me, I, there's like three I want to audition for back to back to back within a year. And if none of them take me and I've spent a year working towards it, then that's it. It's done. Um, but if, if they do, then I, I think that I'd like to try and pursue this. Um, so I was really at training like while you're at college or? Um, so I was, I was on my university's gymnastics team. Oh, right. um, it was a division three school at the time. It's now a club. So no athletic scholarships, nothing, but um, yeah, I was, was competing varsity gymnastics. Um, and, uh, and I was really lucky and got accepted to the national circus school in Montreal, which is great because I had no performance background. <laughs> um, so I graduated from university and basically like, um, a few months later, packed up and moved to Montreal and and started doing circus full time. And where did you go to university again? Uh, so I went to MIT. Uh, and technically, <laughs> I like you're so you're, smart. <laughs> te technically, my my degree is a bachelor's in nuclear engineering. So 
Did y'all hear that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Pretty girls. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so three years of full time school, and then and then from that point, you know, I just sort of I went where the opportunities were, which you know there was another economic recession back in uh, two thousand two thousand seven two thousand eight. It was already starting in two thousand seven, uh, to be totally honest. Um, and so for a while at the start, more of the opportunities were teaching uh, than performing, um, and. I, I wound up with a, a company on the West Coast, coast uh, called Pendulum Aerial Arts. They just closed recently, but they, they've been going for years at that point um, and was one of the, you know, company performers, coach and everything. And uh, so that was where I really kind of found myself as an artist, I think. Um, and in, in part because I had that opportunity to kind of take more time to step back and coach and look at, OK, what what do I want to be putting on stage? And then, yeah, little little by little, it all snowballed until more and more I was doing full-time performance work with various companies. And I've been lucky to work with um, Cirque Alois, Cirque Alphonse, Cirque du Soleil, um, Wonderbolt Circus in Newfoundland. I've worked with uh, yeah, companies and studios across the world as a, a coach uh, as well now. And yeah, I'm, I'm halfway through like transitioning into artistic coordination work for Circus. But I, I am still working as a performer in limbo with all the rest of us right now. And so we'll kind of have to see how that shakes out. So that's, yep, yeah, that's me in a reasonably short nutshell. <laughs> how, what, so after, oh, I see, Pendulum, you, start, you were working with Pendulum. Mm-hmm. How did you, where, or how and when did you get your first big, what you consider your first big contract and what was it and how that worked out? Um, so interestingly, um, Suzanne, who ran Pendulum Aerial Arts at the time, actually had an agency and was often actively uh, helping fill positions for for various companies. And so, you know, the, the economy in the U.S. had crashed and we went, I think, at 1.6 months in, in 2007, 2008 without any performance contracts. Mm-hmm. And I was still contracted to, to work with her as, you know, I was her admin assistant and a, a coach and performer. And we were navigating that together, which of course was frustrating for both of us. And she had an opportunity come up to go to uh, a resort in Turkey for three months of performance work. And so I knew that she'd been, you know, doing that and kind of looking at who was available and everything. And she sat me down one day and said, you know what, Tanya, I'm going to send you. Like you can come back at the end of that three months and finish up your your contract with me, but I want you to have this opportunity and get to go out and perform because we're not able to do it right now and and I want you to have this, um, which was amazing. Of like she let me go, she had to find other people to cover some of the you know the summer camp sessions that she was running and everything, but. Um, like that was sort of the first long chunk of time that I got to put back into just being a performer. And and it was thanks to her generosity in that moment. Um, And then, yeah, after that, like so much of the the industry is, it's little by little just chipping away and and having contacts and connections until people call you at the the right time. What's another, like how did you get to Kadam? Because I think if I recall, that's a fun story as well. Yeah, so that that was very much um, the right people saying my name at the right time. Uh, They called me in 2011 looking for an emergency replacement Mm -hmm. um, because the the artist doing the act was out and her backup was out at the same time. Um, And so I was I was on the road with uh, with Wonderbolt Circus in Newfoundland at the time um, and got a call from the casting agent who didn't normally cover that show, but she was at the moment. And she said, Tanya, why don't I have any updated video of you on Aerial Silks? And I've I've sent it in. This was before they had an automated casting database. So she goes, get me new video right now. Um, And the circus that I was working with was really nice and like got me into the arena where we were performing early and set up lights and everything so that I could try and record some stuff and send it off to Bridget. Um, And uh, I had... Um, one friend in the cast who had already presented me to the artistic director earlier when they knew they might need a backup 
And one of the other people that they called, Isabel Chasse, who most of you have probably seen her video perform and it's the one on YouTube. She's amazing. Um, they had called her to see if she wanted to do it. And she was like, guys, no, I've worked for you for so long. I'm doing other projects. Have you tried calling Tanya? So like three or four people kind of were like, what about Tanya? Like, guys, have you thought about Tanya? Um, and, and that's just sort of how the cookie crumbled in that I was, I was available right away and um, enough people had confidence in me to put my name forward. So they actually, they called me to offer me the job when I was on my way back from Newfoundland to Vancouver. They called me in the Toronto airport and almost had me not take my connecting flight home. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because that's like, that's how, that's how fast they were trying to find somebody. And then they were like, oh wait, it's a long weekend. No one's going to be there. Go ahead, fly home. We'll call you tomorrow and we'll sort it out. So I, I flew home and had, I think, two days at home and then flew back to Montreal, did three rehearsals and, uh, and they put me on stage. Three rehearsals. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. How, so how was that rehearsal process? Did you do some of your own choreography or the original choreography or like, I mean, cause that's not much time to like. No. So it was in, and that was really interesting. And like, again, so much of that stuff comes down to, to who you're working with and what kind of relationship you can build with them. So I was working with one of the coaches there, uh, Dominique, who is really lovely. And she sat down and was like, okay, well, do you, do you know this act? And I was like, of, yeah, of course I know this act. <laughs> um, and she was like, okay, well, do you, do you know Isabel Vaudel's choreography? The, the original Isabel, uh, who had been, she was the one who was performing in the show at the time who was out uh, with an injury. Um, and I said, I mean, more or more or less, I, I know her material. But I'll be honest, it's not, it's not stuff that I would choose. And Dominique just looked at me and goes, okay, well, would you rather propose your own choreography? I was like, yes. I mean, yes. So she goes, okay, well, cool. Like take a, take a minute or two to think about it and like pick a starting position and we'll like, we'll pull you up in the air and put the music on and, and just, let's just see what comes out. So that was, that was basically how we put together uh, the choreography. And um, I, you know, I, I took those two minutes, like who, if you do aerial silks um, and particularly if you did aerial silks back then, you had, you had thought about how you would have performed that act. Um, so I already had all these ideas in my head, of course, but I was expecting to just get told, here's what you're doing, go. Um, and I, you know, there were a few images I picked from the original choreography that I thought were, were super iconic. Um, and I chose to keep them in because of that. Um, and they wound up having me adapt them so that they looked slightly different, but, um, but so I was able to still give a throwback to that original, um, and, and to get the chance to overlap with, with Isabel Vaudel, who actually, she was the pioneer of, of aerial silks as we know it. Um, so to get to overlap with her in that role was really just such a privilege. Awesome. Um, what were you or what other some some other shows that you've been a part of um that were interesting experiences or what you were currently working on and had to leave the show because you had i think you weren't were you, weren't you an avatar uh yeah so i was i was in taruk which was the the yeah the Cirque du Soleil show that was based on james cameron's avatar so that actually it closed halfway through last year uh, okay. But that was a that was a voluntary closure. It had played all of the arenas it could fit in already, hmm. um, which I was super happy to have that experience of getting to close close a world tour. Um, that again, it was it was a role I didn't expect to get offered. They had asked me if I was interested, and I went, "Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, you're one hundred percent going to pick somebody younger than me." Um, and then when they called and offered me the role, I was like, "Oh, oh." Uh, okay, let me, let me take a hot second and think about this. Oh, and also tell my husband that I've been offered a, a role on a touring show again. Because I hadn't even told, I just hadn't occurred to me that it might go to, I don't know. But um, I, I said yes to that role specifically because I'd heard really good things about the cast and crew of that show, that it was a, a really amazing group of people to work with. 
And because I knew that the show was nearing its, uh, its end of lifespan, um, and because that was an experience that I really did want to have, was to, to get to do that last bow with everyone. So, um, yeah, so I've been, I've been committed to more short-term projects since then, just because I was trying to get a little bit more time at home. I have all the time at home I want <laughs> right now. Right. Um, I'm not even going to say careful what you wish for, because I would have, you know, it would have happened either way. Now it's just like a surfeit. Um, but, yeah. Uh, but as, as far as some of the other shows that I, I think were... Um, or ones that really made an impact on me. Um, I was part of the uh, the opening ceremonies for the the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver. Um, that was actually it was just harness work, um, but that was that was really amazing. Um, I mean, I've never performed for an audience that big in my entire life. Uh, I probably never will again with that many people watching from around the world. But um, they did something really unusual with that Olympics, which um, you know normally uh the big you know opening ceremony the performance happens and then they march in the athletes mm -hmm. and for that year they actually reversed things um they uh they brought in all of the athletes first and then so we weren't just performing for the arena and the wow. you know spectators around the world we were we were performing for the athletes themselves and when they walked in they walked past us so we got to be like Oh my God, we're so excited for you. You know, like it's, uh, and some of them are like legitimately stars, you know, like in circus is so small that we don't expect to have anybody know who we are, but like those people are like legit famous, some of them. And so that was, it was super cool and like literally a once in a lifetime opportunity because you don't get to repeat that performance. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was something that was really cool. Just like the, the sheer, scale of it was uh was mind-blowing we were performing being suspended from a inflatable roof in bc place um uh yeah it was it was monumental um i did i um, like watch that video could you like point us where you would be <laughs> uh, no we all we like all look the same we all look the same. So we're all wearing either skis or snowboards. We're like in red head to toe with like goggles and headbands on. Like my afterwards, my family kept sending me photos being like, is this you? Is this one you? Is this one you? There were a few times that I just was like, yeah, that, that's me. Uh, it, it, it wasn't. But like, and, and a lot of us were actually tall because they wanted to have like the, the gangly look of, you know, okay. of people uh, in skis and everything. So... <laughs> Yes, I honestly like I it was only through knowing those people from such an intensive rehearsal process that I was able to look at them and go like that's totally not me but that person's close enough that I'm telling my family that it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> you gotta make them happy somehow. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, um, what is, yeah, good, we're on kind of time. Um, what are some like nuggets of information or like advice that you could give for anybody who's training in the art form or working in the art form in any capacity um or just life nuggets um that you have over because you you've traveled so far and done experienced a great deal um so what do you think some things um usually like the main advice i give to to anybody that's training is to learn it the right way the first time around <laughs> um, there, there are amazing studies about, in, in like ballet, about how many repetitions uh, it takes to, to learn how to do um, de dégagé the right way or any kind of um, movement the right way. And then about how many times it takes to relearn the movement correctly if you didn't learn it correctly the first time around. And the difference in numbers is uh, it's quite steep and it really makes you consider where you're putting your time. I was really, like I said, I grew up doing artistic gymnastics as this like monumental uh, <laughs> beast of, a, of an athlete. Uh, I was like, I, I mean, I was a giraffe, but I was very skinny. But um, my coaches took me aside when I first started learning how to do saltos and they had a sit down conversation with me where they said, hey, we, we wanna talk to you because you know, you're, you're ready to start doing some of these higher level skills now but we need to approach things differently with you than we do with some of the other athletes. Like most of the kids who are learning these skills are about six years old. 
and they're about waist high. So if they change their mind halfway through the skill, we're going to pick them up out of the air, put them on the floor, yell at them, and then have them go take a timeout for five minutes and then come back to class. They said, if you do that, you're not walking away. And chances are that you could hurt one of us and take us with you. So they said, you need to be really observant. Look at how other people are doing skills, process the, te the technique correctly, because if you're not doing it right, you're not getting it around at your size. It's not a bad thing. It just is, it is what it is. There's less margin for error. We're going to tell you when we think you're ready to do this skill. And then your job is to come back to us and tell us when you're actually ready to do it mentally. And that's the deal that we're going to have, you know, so they were never discouraging. They never once said you can't do something. They just set out clear, healthy guidelines that were going to keep me safe. And that is something that I took into my training because that idea of like, okay, at my size, if I'm not using the right muscles, I'm just, I'm going to plateau. I'm going to hit a skill I can't do because I won't be able to, to do it the right way. Um, and obviously like if you're shorter, uh, it's just a, it's a shorter fulcrum. I'm sorry, this is me getting super physics-y. Um, anyway. you can, you can cheat a lot of motions if you're smaller. And that's why it's amazing for kids to learn acrobatics because like it just, there is a facility there, but you can learn so much if you are willing to take the time to learn how to engage the correct muscles. And it's not wasted time because once you've really processed the fundamentals of that, then the speed at which you can learn things really starts to accelerate because all those building blocks are there already. Um, I really physically did not struggle when I was in circus school because those foundations had been laid for me already in my gymnastics career. Career. I mean, like I wasn't, I wasn't a great competitor, but they gave me, they gave me that foundation that I needed so that when I transitioned to circus, it honestly, it was not, it wasn't like I was throwing myself up against a wall, you know, which isn't to say it wasn't still hard, but um, not in that sense. So like for anybody who, who is doing um, aerial or acrobatic training, that is always like my number one takeaway is like, don't be scared to learn things the right way the first time around, even if it takes longer. Um, my professional advice for anybody who's going into uh, be it teaching or performing or choreography or trying to build an online brand for themselves is um, don't think of anybody as your competition. And honestly, you can even take that back into class. The person in class with you, the person at an audition next to you, uh, that other person who has a similar skill set to you, who has more followers on Instagram, no one in this industry is your competition. Because when it comes down to it, like I said, most of most of the jobs I've gotten, and particularly a lot of the the most interesting, the most fun, and um, like I guess the, the most recognized work that I've gotten, like I said, it's it's come because people were willing to refer me and put my name forward. Um, someday, if you decide you want to become a professional unicyclist and somebody calls another unicyclist and they're not available for a job, they're going to get asked, do you know somebody else that you would recommend for the job? And you wanna be the person on that person's lips. You, you want to be that person. And the, the amount of creative and artistic exchange that you can have while still fully respecting people's own creative work and those boundaries around it, there's a lot that can be done there. So don't think of anybody as, uh, as competition. Those are fabulous. Thank you. Um, my other one is kind of maybe just going back down memory lane. What are some of the either dance acts, dance or acts that you love to perform or that you love watching? Mm. <laughs> um, ooh, that's uh, they <laughs> can't. So many, I know. Uh, <laughs> Um, I've, I've had, I've had a lot of acts that I've loved performing. Um, I'm one of those people, I had a really interesting conversation with, uh, with the professional track students, uh, in Chicago, uh, at a loft in February, where I was asking them to, to kind of try and separate, um, there are, they were, they were right in the process of needing to build their graduating acts and were like massively stressed about it. And, and we had a long conversation asking to them to try and separate 
their artistic voice and their act voice. Um, which for me is, it's not something that everybody does, but I'll like, I'll throw it out there. Cause I think it's, I think it's a fun concept. Um, I, I know what I want to say as an artist. Like if, if I had to like put adjectives out there, um, but that's not my act voice. My act voice is different with each and every act, um, particularly in the sense that I usually have a, a character which is not me that is the character that performs that act. So, you know, I what I want to say as an artist, I want it to be authentic. I want it to feel real for people. Um, I want it to feel engaging. I want to feel like we're, we're exchanging thoughts and emotions and ideas. Um, and that's something that carries across, but an individual act might be, okay, I want to talk about um, feeling vulnerable and uh, raw. Um, the, the act that I performed, I, I was in Chicago to work with the students and then got to perform in a uh, sanctuary cabaret at the end of that week and at the towards the end of that week I, I performed that piece just for the students so that they could kind of see what I meant by that because that act was about um, having someone break up with you and and still loving them and still wanting the best for them even though it super sucks and it hurts and you miss them um, and I'm not the sort of person that's ever going to put those emotions out directly from myself. Um, I'm not, I'm not a natural performer. I'm, I'm an introvert who has converted to learn how to be more present on stage. But I know that that's an experience that a lot of people have lived through. And to feel like somebody else understands those feelings for those people is really powerful. And so I wanted to like distill down some of those feelings and and express them to those people so that they knew that they were heard. Um, and that was, like, so that was that act, but like I have other acts where I'm, I'm doing clowning or just trying to be like the, the act that I was doing the Avatar show, it was, it was literally just meant to be a teenage girl showing off for her friends. You know, and I was like, woohoo, this is, this is amazing. And it's really simple, but if I do it right, and if I, you know, if I really think about how does that influence the choreography that I want to put in, I can, I can make that authentic as well. Um, so, yeah, so I, I've loved so many of the acts that I've performed just because I think if, if you really think about what your artistic voice is and how you can, how you can be true to that, you can make the most out of almost any act, even if it's like, just be a pretty Christmas ornament in the air. And I'm like, I can do that. Um, the most recent corporate event that I, I did, um, it was a very, very last minute thing where we got asked, me and my, uh, my aerial hoop partner got asked to put together some synchronized choreography uh, on both hoop and on silks. And we did not pick either the theme or the music for these acts. Some of you are about to cringe if you're old enough. The act music that they picked for Aerial Silks was uh, Bring Me Back to Life by Evanescence. Okay. <laughs> I, I hear someone <laughs> laughing. I hear someone laughing even though their microphone is muted. So, um, and, and so we were sitting there going like, oh man, would you, okay, you know what? We just have to lean into this. Like, we have to make it so cheesy and so over the top that like it, it it becomes fun again right like people people were coming up to us in our rehearsal space being like why are you making me watch this and we're like because we're getting paid right but like there i there i am in the air with this music going and like you know choreographing like a head banging while like thrashing with the fabric because like you might, you know, that's what you've been, that's what you've been given. It's, and you can make it super fun. Um, and everybody there fully knew how cheesy that music was, who wasn't the ones performing too. So of course they, you know, they don't want us to feel embarrassed about what we're doing. And I'm like, oh no, I will, I will bring you this. All of it. Like you wanted 10, you're getting a let, like we were going spinal tap with the volume. Uh, that's another really old reference for some of you guys, but um, if, if in doubt, and this, this had been my motto for like at least 
two of the last three years. I'm working on I'm working on modifying it slightly, but um, a lot of what I think in terms of performance is do it until someone tells you it's too much. It's so easy to turn the volume back down again a little bit afterwards, but um, and and if you do that, then you you feel so fully invested in it and focused in the moment. And like people talk about, like the flow state in terms of like the ideal work state, you you hit it, you hit it so easily when you do that because like there's no there's no room to second guess yourself anymore. You're just enjoying it. Um, you guys can I can just like send a link at some point, but um, as far as other like seminal dance works since it was like the international day of dance recently uh, if you guys have not seen um uh la 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 human steps uh amelie it it is an absolutely beautiful piece i i know somebody has put up the the full uh the full video of it on youtube it's like patently not supposed to be there the the you know the description is in mexican or spanish pardon um, but uh, the, the full thing is absolutely out there on the internet to see. Um, the company sadly no longer exists, but um, their, their work was really something groundbreaking in terms of um, uh, the movement style and how they were using classical ballet technique. And so that one for me is like, it's super fun to watch because it was just like, I never thought about ballet dancers moving this way. So yeah, I, I that one is totally a go watch it. It's fun. Yeah, th I forgot about them. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, I love them as well. Um, and I love that. That's something that's hard for me to try and coach into dancers or train. But I love that the words that you said about trying to make it whatever it is that you're given, because I was totally figured that out in college. Like, gosh, I hate this gram exercise, but you know what? I gotta have to own it. And then they're like, oh, you're. I'm like. I'm making it work for me, mm -hmm. and making it not feel like it's a, a drag. And that's, that's, it's a mental switch, I think, for me, at least, to, to yeah. put my own heart and spin on it. Um, when you're given something like, this just doesn't feel like me, well, but I kind of have to do it because it's going to pay the bills. Um, <laughs> or it's what, you know, it's a means to get to somewhere yeah. else, too. But have yeah. fun doing it. Put it, yeah. Exactly. You figure out how to have fun doing it by just doing it harder. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, I'm going to open it up to anybody who's watching and listening. What questions you can either um, reveal yourself if you're just got a picture up and unmute yourself and chat or put it in the chat, um, your question and I'll, I'll, and you just go for it. It's free, free for all. <laughs> I know. <laughs> get ready. <laughs> Where did you get your shirt? Um, my my sh I I'm so glad somebody noticed because I put it on just for this. Um, so this shirt was a, a gift from one of my uh, best friends, Joe Pinzon, who uh, is also a, a silks performer. Um, the company is called Lazy Oaf. They apparently make like most of their stuff just as like one size fits all unisex. Yeah, he just like gave it to me one day. Almost all of my cat paraphernalia, and there is a lot of it at this point, um, was given to me as gifts from friends. I did not even have to go seek it out by myself after a certain point. It just, it keeps appearing. It's the gift that keeps on giving. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Gina, it looks like you got a question down there. Yeah, well, kind of. I'm just nosy, really. I just want to know what, um, like, upcoming projects you have or you're working on or, like, are there things that we can see that you're working on virtually? Um, not, not virtually as of right now. Like I said, I, I don't have any kind of equipment other than a yoga mat, Shamwa. Part of me is like, mm, I should, I should brush up my clown act just cause like I like it and I haven't done it in a while. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I was supposed to be touring with Wonderbolt Circus again this summer, uh, in a project called a uh, big top pop-up, which was inspired by, um, a, an actual, uh, event in Newfoundland, a big, uh, a big fire that was ha uh, that started in a traditional circus tent. Anyway, that project has been postponed, uh, like most things. 
Uh, I'm also working as the uh, production manager and artistic coordinator for uh, a contemporary circus show called Nix. Um, that's being directed by a woman named Joanne Mador, who is from here uh, in Quebec. It's uh, five, five artists, one uh, classically trained dancer and four circus artists. Um, we are also having to postpone that. So we're, that's now looking at premiering in spring of 2021. And hopefully we can get back to to doing some rehearsals and creation at some point in this year. Um, apart from that, yeah, I was I was really hoping to do more like touring and teaching this year, and obviously that went like straight down the drain. But I'm I'm hoping to pick that up at some point in the future when studios can can host people again. Um, and uh, yeah, like it's, it's been a gradual process over the last uh, four or five years, starting to work more in artistic coordination and creation management. Uh, so I've been working a lot with Joe Pinzon and his company Short Round Productions. Um, I don't know if the show Filament is still available to watch in its entirety online. I'll check with him. Um, that was a, a show that uh, we put together and uh, it premiered uh, at Circa Festival in the Czech Republic a few years ago and then since played at Adelaide Fringe Festival, Edinburgh Fringe, and last fall we did a crazy uh, tour of Europe, uh, 21, 21 cities in 25 days uh, across Germany, Italy, and Luxembourg. I will say like nine out of 10, I recommend it. I would do it again, but oh my God, it was, it was insane. And for, for that show, I'm actually, I'm just the, the manager, uh, but it, by manager, that also means slash coach slash assistant artistic director uh, slash I pull all the aerial acts for that show in performance. Um, and that is the kind of stuff that I, I really like and I'm hoping to do more of as I'm transitioning out of performing because it kind of lets me get back in my engineering brain a little bit. Um, it takes a lot of organization and cat herding. Um, and, and also it takes understanding the artistic side of the field. Um, and so for me, I find it really balances out those, those two sides for me. Um, I'm looking, it's like, obviously I'd love to keep doing more of that, but again, it will, it will depend on, on what projects are available. But Joe does have another show that he wants to make. Um, and if that can get off the ground in the next year or two, then I am 100% gonna, gonna be there to help make it. Awesome. Who else yeah, has, has a good awesome. question? Carolina, I think, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> what have been the most challenging thing that you have facing on circus and how you deal with it? Mm, that is a really good question. Um, personally, uh, and this, this isn't going to be everyone's experience, but I, I, I think it is a little bit generally applicable and like I'll go into like what some of the ramifications of it are for for different people you get told no a lot like a lot a lot um especially at the beginning of your career when people don't know you as much and and they have more and more options these days so you will go and audition and you won't get a job and you'll send out something to a casting agency and not hear back from them or you'll apply for a festival and not get in. And um, it can be very disheartening. Like most of us who do it all the time, we just call it the grind. Um, and at the beginning, it really, it, the thing is like, everyone's like, oh, you just have to get the ball rolling. At the beginning, it's not a ball. It, it just feels like a raw boulder and you're literally just like picking it up by one end and heaving it over and feeling like it's gonna stop dead again because it's not round yet. And you have to grind all those edges off. And that's what the process feels like at the beginning. Don't just, don't get discouraged by it. It is, it is fairly normal. And getting told no a lot is, it, it doesn't stop. Um, I can tell you guys, uh, what was this, five? Yeah, no, six, no, four, there we go. Uh, four, four years ago, um, I was, uh, you know, sending, sending off my videos to you know, companies around the world being like, hire me. I'm great. I promise. Um, and, uh, wound up hearing back from, um, one of the biggest variety 
shows in Germany. Uh, they're called GOP. They're still great. They're amazing. Um, they have multiple venues across most of Germany and I think a few other countries, probably one or two in Austria and some far from places there. Um, and what I got back from the casting agent was, I, I swear, and I, I think part of it is probably like, you know, translation into English, but also just the German tendency to be uh, quite direct. But what she wrote back to me was essentially, look, I'm sure lots of people think you're great. You just don't have that special something that we're looking for. But, you know, by, by all means, like, you know, send us your, your stuff now and again in the future, you know, you never know. Um, and I was, I was busy working on a cruise ship with some friends at that point and like showed the, showed the email to like one of my friends and was like, I just like chuck myself off the boat at this point, you know, like, what do I, what do I do? I've been working professionally for 10 years and I have worked with some of the biggest companies in this industry and some of the smallest too, you know, like, don't, but, um, like how, how do I even respond? Like that's, it wasn't even like constructive feedback. Like, oh, we'd love to see you do something with a bit more comedy. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll keep getting told no. Um, and uh, oftentimes it, it won't be related to anything that you, you can or can, can fix or, you know, you just don't know what people are looking for or, and often it's the case that you want to try and present something that's a little bit more challenging for, and that is less seen in the industry, but because people don't see it regularly, they don't want to take a chance on it. Like I said, I love doing my clown act. I still have a hard time getting companies to hire me and to incorporate that act into shows. Um, and honestly, and some of like, some of you guys may experience this with all kinds of stuff. Like I, and I want to be very clear. Um, I think the industry is making changes, but I also want to be very clear. It is still, uh, it's still ageist. It's still sexist. It is still racist. It is still discriminatory against different body types, against different gender presentations, all of that. It is real. Um, I am very lucky that the only times that it's really come back to bite me in the ass is because I'm very tall. And if I'm going to look bigger than the guys on stage, it doesn't always work. Or if I'm not going to match the other girls. But um, it's it's real and it's very easy to get discouraged. And again, that's why I was saying don't, don't think of other people as your competition. Think of them as uh, a support system and a means to get connected to the people who will hire you and who will see your stellar qualities, um, because that's what it's going to take. Um, so I know, okay, I still have nine minutes. I'm going to go like very, very briefly. This is like the, this is the, the more, you know, PSA lecture, um, about, uh, about creative content and artists. Um, when you see professional artists putting stuff on, on the Instagram or the YouTube or whatever, and it's skills that you've never seen before. What I want you to do is just take one step back and contemplate what are they probably putting that out for and what are the ramifications of copying that move or that sequence. Oftentimes, it might not be much. For people who you can see have like 16,000 followers and like hashtag every single aerial beauty, I don't know. They're doing that to gain followers. And if that's how they're earning their money, that's great. If you see people who are emerging professionals trying to gain work on stage, they have created that content so that they try to have something unique to sell to companies, to auditions, to casting, to, you know, directors. Um, and particularly if you see that that is somebody that is underrepresented in our industry, do not take their shit or at least ask them first, because those are the people that need that edge. They still are being asked, well, like, oh, we'd have to make a role for you on stage. No, no, no. Like, you just put them on stage. But if, if the idea is that they kind of have to have a little something extra to stand apart from the crowd in a good way, that's what they've spent all that time on making that stuff for. Like, I, I teach people all of the skills that I've made that I think they can do safely because I'm kind of a proto-aerialist. I stay skinny. I can do the splits. I'm white. I'm a girl. So I don't have that barrier in place. But so I, I take this opportunity because when people let me speak, I'm like, oh my God, 
I can actually like help say this because sometimes the people who need it to be said don't have the opportunity. If you see somebody like that in this industry and they're putting out unique content, please speak to them before you start copying that content and particularly before you start disseminating it on the internet to all of your followers so that it becomes common lexicon. All right, sorry, I'm done lecturing, but like every, every, every time that if it comes up because like it's really important to me because because I see that you know my very good friends who who are in that situation have struggled with casting because of that um, and I, I want to see I want to see a more diverse performing arts scene so yeah like support the hell out of those people I love it PSA all the time um <laughs> Any other lap, we have maybe time like one more question-ish. You got it. Again, you can chat it in the thing, in the chat, <laughs> chat it in the chat. Um, or, or comment. <laughs> um, I guess I'll just say one last thing. Go ahead, Gina. Uh, because I gotta go. But it's really just that I enjoyed listening. I just love listening to people talk. So these are great. And I really enjoyed all your little tidbits. Um, and yeah, keep shining because you're rocking the industry and I love seeing your stuff. So. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm, yeah, I'm so excited to get to see you guys doing the same. So. Yeah, but I'm going to go. Bye, you guys. Bye, Gina. Thank you. Talk to you later. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I love everybody who's on here. I know everybody in this. It's so fun. The great people. Some people I haven't seen in a while. What's the, actually, I have a question. You, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just oh my God. It's like the silence is getting too awkward. <laughs> you, um, what's the name of the apparatus, the Lyra on top of the, well, the Tualira that you kind of created. What's the name that you call it? I forget. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. So um, I I convinced uh, Peter Boulanger, who actually had made the apparatus, to rename it the Moon's Eye. When he first presented me that apparatus, he was calling it the Eyeball, and I was like, Peter, no one is going, no one is going to hire an act that's called the Eyeball. Oh God. Um, so yeah, he, he had showed it to me and was like, oh, you should play around on it some. And so like I'd started playing around on it. And then one day he came to me and was like, okay, cool. Cause like I've, I've booked you to, to perform on it in like a few weeks. And I was like, mm, I'd better, I'd better get my act together. Um, so yeah, I, you know, put together that act and then said like, can we, can we please start calling it the moon's eye because it translates well in both French and English. And like, I, I want you to have a good chance to present this to clients is something unique that you do just saying <laughs> um and it's really it's been great most of the people who have wound up performing on variations of that apparatus have contacted either either me or peter to ask about it and ask if it was something that we minded them doing um which obviously because most people were taking the time to to think about it and hang it in a slightly different orientation or make it a different size we were like you know, go go for broke obviously if if this if this sparks creative ideas in you and it's not just about copying content then yes we, that's more more artistic content is it's really where it's where it's at but yeah so it's, it was really it's been lovely over the last few years um seeing that be uh, a part of of the exchange just that people contacted us to be like could we kind of take this idea and tweak it yes go for it that's awesome. I'm glad people ask permission. That's really <laughs> rock on <laughs> responsible. Um, well, I'm going to conclude our interview with a humongous thank you, Tanya, for joining us this evening and everybody who's watching and listening. Thank you. It's great to see you um, or see your name, Maggie. I, hi, Maggie. Um, and this will be up soon. So please share it out on our YouTube channel. And um, Tanya is if you have any questions, she's great at be answering anything you, your heart desires. She's an, I wouldn't say complete open book, but when it comes to circus, <laughs> you're very giving and generous with your advice and information. And I see you all over the social media doing that. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah. Well, and yeah, you know, like I wanted to reiterate for, I guess, for anybody listening to this eventually, and particularly for you guys that, uh, that showed up here, um, 
yeah, like I said, this, this industry, so much of it is about um, community and connections and, and networking. And um, like you, you heard how I got into this, I would not have become a circus artist if uh, my initial coaches hadn't taken the time to, to talk to me and encourage me um, and to say, hey, this is, this is something that you can do. Um, and, uh, and so that's always something that's present in my mind when I'm interacting with the rest of the community. Like this is something that all of you guys can do, whether or not it's at a local or professional level or in coaching or in performance. And, you know, it's always going to be um, a range balanced against, you know, what your other needs are um, and obligations and what the industry is looking for in any one given moment. But you can, you can do this. Um, and if sometimes you need a little bit of advice or help trying to figure out what your next step might be, like that's, that's something that now when I'm in a position of having been around since the age of the dinosaurs, hopefully I can occasionally give some advice. Um, and if you don't like it, then just ignore it. But yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, and I, I hope that I can give back as much as I've been given because I've been very lucky to be able to do this with my life. It's been pretty cool so far. Yeah, that's awesome. So inspiring. Thank you so much, Tanya. And thank you everybody else. Um, I'll see you when I see you in this world, uh, virtually or live, hopefully live soon. Good night, everybody. Stay safe, stay well to all your families. Thank you so much. Ciao. Right. Thank you guys. Wave off. <laughs>